Welcome to Connection Live. My name is Jeff Hosey. I'm the executive pastor here at Connection, and I want to be the first to say welcome to church. Whether you're watching by yourself or gathered with a group, you are an important part of this church family. Though we may not have met in person yet, we're thinking about you and praying for you every week. We're going to be taking communion together a little later in the service, so this is a great time to grab those elements that are going to represent the body and blood of Christ. Then a great time to start preparing your hearts. Today is going to be a life-changing day, no matter where you are, if you're ready for it. So thank you for being a part of this church family. Let's worship together. of the Lord. Guys, today is going to be an awesome day. We've got a lot of fun, surprising things coming up in the service today. And I want to start off by reading some scripture together from Psalm 3. It says, Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory. The one who holds my head high. You know, we love the Psalms because it's that beautiful poetic language and it's encouraging right but what the heck is it talking about who are these enemies who wrote this you know psalm 3 is a psalm of david and if you don't know who david is he's kind of a big deal jesus came from the lineage of david david was his great 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 times 14 grandfather david was the guy who defeated the philistines these enemies that he's talking about here might be surprising to you. But David had a son named Absalom. And Absalom decided that he needed to take the throne from daddy. And he got a whole bunch of warriors together and went to kill David and take over the throne. Boy, that's, that's a lot different than just some theoretical enemies, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know what you've got going on in your life right now. And I'm not going to promise you that when you walk out of this place today, all those things are going to be gone. But I can promise you that in the middle of a situation that seems so insane, you can still hold your head high. Remember what he said? But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. This morning, remember that we have a hope in our God, that even though life is hard, our God is good. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I'd love to invite you to stand this morning as we raise a hallelujah together to the one who is in control of it all.
ask you all to be seated for just a second. We're going to go into our time of communion. We're going to do something a little bit different today together. And we're going to use our imaginations here for a second. So if you're comfortable, I invite you to just close your eyes. None of the lights have anything to do with this. There's no pictures. One of the most amazing things about Jesus was that he was simply magnetic. And he brought people around him that you would think were impossible people to reach. And one of those most impossible people had to be the Roman centurion we read about at the cross. You know, a Roman soldier would have no concept of the Messiah that was coming. He had probably not heard the scriptures read aloud. He was simply there doing his job crucifying another criminal on another cross on another day. But as the day progressed, he heard something that made him think. From the middle cross, the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, a last-ditch prayer from the cross wasn't something new, but this man, Jesus, prayed like someone was listening. But like every other crucifixion, there came a moment when the last breath was breathed and that criminal Jesus died. When the story was over. But it wasn't. In Matthew 27, verse 51, we read, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and Many of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. We read that after Jesus died, earth itself was mourning. It goes on in verse 54, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. You know, and we know now that three days later, God would raise Jesus. But even in the darkest of days, even at his most human moment of death, his divinity was unmistakable. The soldiers couldn't help but join heaven and earth in worshiping the battered and broken Messiah. I want to remind you and meditate on a verse that we all know really well. Isaiah 53, 5 it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. As part of our time of communion here this morning, in just a few minutes, we're going to be singing a song together. We're not going to rush anything. We are going to take some time to praise and remember. Would you pray with me? Lord, what you did for us is not something that we can fully grasp. As undeserving sinners, we come before you humbly and say thank you. And this morning, Lord, remind us of what that truly means. Of the true cost you were willing to bear because you love us that much. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You'll find communion at the back and sides of the room. And I'd encourage you in the next few minutes to just take communion whenever you're ready. And then join us in worship.
in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow son of suffering There's a God who weeps, there's a God who pleads, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering, some imagine you a distant and remote but you chase us down in merciful pursuit to the sinner you were grace and the broken you embraced in the end the proof is in your words in the end the proof is in There's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering. I'd like to invite you to stand as we continue to worship this Jesus who gave it all for us this morning and sing your cross. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God.
it's just a powerful thing to praise Jesus, to lift him up, to remember what he has done, is doing, and will do for all of us. And uh, for those of you who are joining us online, I'm so glad that you are here today. If you were here in the room, you saw some of those baptisms taking place. That is a fantastic picture of what Jesus has done for us. Whenever anyone is immersed in the water, they're reenacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Scripture actually ties those two things together. And I want to know, have you been immersed? Have you been baptized? If you haven't, if you're thinking about making Jesus as Lord, that's the next step you take. When you're ready to go public with him, you get in the water and you reenact his death, burial, resurrection. You ask for that for your life. It's your conscience calling out to God. It's your way of saying, I'm all in. And if you haven't done that, we'd like to give you the opportunity to do that. That's what this church exists to do, get people connected to God and to each other through Jesus. Literally, that's our mission. That's our purpose. And so uh, if that's a step that you need to take, our baptistry is always open and ready, uh, and we would love to help you take that step. In fact, we have somebody being immersed today. We have a baptism Sunday coming up soon as well. So if you're interested in that, we want to help you take that step. As so many hundreds of Connection Christians have done, your baptism into Jesus Christ can be one of the most memorable and meaningful things you've ever done. Those of you who've already been immersed into Jesus, think back to the day that you were baptized into him and all the things that come back with that. I remember one of the first baptisms I participated in as a pastor. I wasn't even ordained yet. It was memorable, and it was meaningful, and not all the right reasons either. The church that I was in, I was a young guy. Two of our teenagers wanted to be baptized. They wanted me to immerse them. At the same time, two of our children from the children's ministry also wanted to be immersed, and I talked to their dad, and I said, I think you should baptize them. So he was in for that. So there's four of us, four kids, children and teenagers, let's be respectful, and uh, two adults. The baptistry in this church was pretty large, so we were all going to get in the water together. Now, back then, what we would do so that the person who was actually doing the immersing wouldn't get wet, we'd put on fishing waders. And so it, I know it sounds silly, but it worked because, you know, they come up to about here and they're rubberized. And so there were two pair of waders back behind the stage of this church. Perfect. I didn't think about why there were two. I just grabbed one at random, and I gave Dad the other pair and said, hey, here we go. And we walked through what we would do, and we got into the water, all six of us. And I remember out of the corner of my eye, as I'm talking to the two young men and taking their confession of faith, I could see Dad, and his face was doing some funny things. And I thought to myself, well, that's really cool. He's so touched by this experience of baptizing his two young boys into Christ. And so at the time when he said he would do this, he said, but I, I'll do the baptizing, but I want you to do the talking because I'm not good with that. And I'm like, I'm like 19 years old. You've been a Christian longer than I've been alive, but okay. So I'm, I'm taking the confession of faith, and Dad still has this funny look on his face. I baptize the two young men, immerse them in the water. Dad baptizes his two boys. It's a great thing. We come off out of the baptistry to the back to the changing area. I said, Greg, that's just so cool. You were so touched baptizing your boys, and you were all worked up. And he goes, yeah, it was a meaningful experience. It was cool, but that's not what my face was doing. Apparently, there were two pair of waders because one of them had a hole right about here. And when six of us got in the water, the water came up to the point. He said those, ba those waders were filling with water from the moment we got in the baptistry. And so he showed me. He just pulled them off. They're like, splash, water just everywhere. So those boys and their dad will never forget that day that they got baptized. And I hope you don't forget the day that you, if you have said yes to Jesus, that that was a significant milestone in your faith walk. In fact, hundreds of Connection Christians have made this decision. I don't know, but for you, maybe this is a decision that's in your immediate future and you're thinking about it. And uh, some people are still studying. That's great. If you're thinking about it, that's awesome. You take the time that you need. This is an important thing to commit your whole life to Jesus and go public with that. And uh, for some of you, maybe even you've got some questions about that. That's fine. We're a church that allows all questions. We'll talk about anything. We'll, we'll take as long as we need to go over anything. We'll just look at the Bible and say, what does it say? And help me do the next right thing. You know, so if you're asking yourself, I think baptism is something I should do, but I'm not sure why. Or if you're a Christian, but you're not sure why, if you're telling somebody how they should become a Christian or why, what they should do with baptism, let's just ask the question, why are we baptized? And first of all, just listen to Jesus and, and hear what he has to say. Very last words Jesus said before he left the planet. These are in Matthew chapter 28, if you want to find these words. And uh, Jesus is talking to his closest disciples and he was, uh, so he's, this is after he's died on the cross, raised from the dead on the third day. This is 40 days later. He comes to his closest disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Here's what I want you all to do. I want you all to go make disciples. 
If you don't know what that word disciples is, if it's kind of a churchy word, it literally just means student or apprentice. So Jesus is inviting his students and apprentices to go out and make more disciples and apprentices. Go out and make disciples of all the nations. In other words, anyone and everyone's available to become a Christian. We're not going to discriminate against anyone. Anyone who wants to hear about Jesus and accept him can. Go out and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then go ahead and teach them all the things that I taught you, everything that I've commanded. And I'll be with you always, even till the end of the age. And this is what Jesus says we should do. When we want to go and be what he is, we want to be as a church on mission with Jesus, we got to do what he said. And he said to go baptize people. So that's what we do. We invite people to become students of Jesus. When they're ready to commit to him, we immerse them in water, as he said. And then we continue to teach from the youngest children all the way up through the oldest adults. We think it's important to say, what did Jesus say to do? Let's do that. We also, as a church, because we take Jesus so seriously, we look at his example. And we say, what did he do? So when we baptize people, we're not only following the command of Jesus, but we're also following the example of Jesus. I don't know if you knew that or not, but Jesus himself was also baptized. I'll take you back in the Gospel of Matthew earlier, so if you're already there, and if you're not, I highly advise you get one of these. And if you don't have a paper version of the Bible, we want to give you one. So after service, if you go to the hub and say, can I get one of those Bibles that Pastor Brian was talking about, we'll hook you up. If you're watching online and you'd like a, a one, I'll tell you what, just let me know. You can go to Amazon. I can point you to some really good ones, but if that's intimidating to you, just let me know and we'll help you find one. So... But if you want to go back to Matthew chapter 3, we find these words, Matthew three thirteen. This is three years before Matthew 28. This is at the beginning of Jesus' teaching ministry. It says, Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. That would be John the Baptist, not John the Gospel writer. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, oh, it should be done. We must carry out all that God requires. It's to fulfill all righteousness, as some versions say. And so John agreed to baptize him. And after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened. Just imagine that. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. Baptism was so important to Jesus that the first thing he did as he started his ministry was to be immersed. He sets an example for all of us. Before he ever changed water to wine, before he ever cast out demons, before he ever called students to be his disciples, before he ever did any of the amazing teaching like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, he went himself and he got baptized. And so when, we are, um, when we're baptized as followers of Jesus, we're not just obeying Jesus' teaching, we're following an example that he set for us, and that's what we're told to do. The Apostle Peter would later say, later, much later in life, he wrote this in First Peter, we follow in his steps. So if Jesus our Lord was baptized, if he tells us to be baptized, that's one really compelling reason to be baptized. And if you're still thinking about it, or if you're wondering how would I explain this to somebody, let's just go ahead and think about why was Jesus baptized? Because if you ever look at somebody, you think, there's a person that probably doesn't need to be baptized. I think Jesus would be top of the list, so why was he? It's very instructive to us if we'll look at this. One of the first things that I noticed uh, is that John the Baptist had the same question. Do you notice that? John's like, what are you, what are you doing here? Uh, we had, for example, John, just a little while before this, had started his ministry of going out and calling people to repentance. And so John would just, out in the desert, just start preaching, and people would show up because he was crazy looking. He had that camel skin coat, and uh, he was eating locusts and honey, and he's just fire and brimstone preacher. He's actually an Old Testament prophet. And he's just, people would come to listen to him, and he'd go like, you need to repent, and you need to repent, you need to repent, you need to repent, and you tax collectors need to quit cheating people, and you soldiers need to quit taking bribes. You repent, you repent. Jesus, what are you doing here? I think you're in the wrong line. You don't need to repent. Oh, you're here to baptize me. Yeah, no, no. Can you imagine the confusion for John? Jesus is the one he's setting up. John's there preparing the way for Jesus, and Jesus is here to be baptized like he's one of the other sinful people? It really confused John, but Jesus said, look, we got to do this, and let's see why. One of the things I noticed really quickly here, if you want to just jot this down, for Jesus, his baptism really literally marked a turning point in his life. And for you and for me, when we are baptized, it does the same thing. Your baptism marks a turning point in your life. For, for 30 years up to this point, here's what we know about Jesus. What was his occupation? 
carpenter or a stonemason, maybe. So for 30 years, he's done what his stepdad Joseph did. He swung a hammer for a living. He stopped at QT for a couple of hot dogs and a Diet Mountain Dew for lunch every day. You know, he did, did, he did like blue collar stuff. That was Jesus' life. He went to school when he was younger. He worked with his hands. But at 30, he marked a turning point because at the age of 30, you could become a rabbi according to Jewish law. So his baptism marked the turning point. No longer is he Jesus the carpenter. He's now Jesus the rabbi. He's Jesus the teacher. He can start calling other people to follow him. It was a turning point in his life. Now, baptism for us marks a turning point too, but it's a little bit different for us because Jesus wasn't turning away from sin. He wasn't repenting of anything he had done wrong. But man, for us, isn't that true? Like we all have things that we need to turn from. It's okay to say, yeah, because like that's the story of every single human being. And uh, this place is a place where we accept each other. And so I, I just look like Jesus was very clear in his ministry that he was not put off by people who had a shady past. He would go eat with anyone. He would hang out with anyone who would listen to him talk. He would tell them the truth, but they liked him. I like how Andy Stanley always said it. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. There's something about a guy who can go around with people who have had a pretty sketchy past and they don't feel judged. I mean, they, they know he's going to tell them the truth. But there's like this time that Jesus went to dinner and he got criticized for who he was choosing to eat with. And this is in Luke chapter 5, verse 30. It says, The Pharisees and their teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. They didn't have the guts to go to Jesus. They went to the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them. I love this. They, they talked to Jesus' disciples, but Jesus says, Guys, I've got this. And he says, Jesus answered them to the Pharisees, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they're righteous like you all, but to those who know that they are sinners and need to repent. And Jesus was pretty harsh with the Pharisees, but I have a feeling that he loved Pharisees just as much as he loved the people who already knew how sinful they were. And he's so harsh with them because he's trying to get their attention. They were so arrogant, and he had to somehow pierce that guard that they had up, that we're the good people and we don't associate with bad people. And to Jesus, he's like, y'all are bad people just in different ways, and I'm here to save all of you. But in the meantime, let's just go ahead and admit it. If I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm going to go where the sick people are. If I'm a savior, I'm going to go where, where the sinful people are. And Jesus says, I call people to come and make a change in their life. I come here to offer them a new way. And anyone who accepts that invitation from Jesus will never be sorry. You'll be so happy. You have to give something up. You give up your old life, but your old life is dead. Why? When you do the math on it, Jesus says, once you do the math, you're going to realize it's the best deal you've ever been offered. That's why it's an amazing thing to say yes to Jesus. And so these holier-than-thou Pharisees are complaining to Jesus, complaining to him, but he says, look, I came to offer people a turning point in life. And it made a real impact on the apostle Peter because it wasn't too long after Jesus died and rose from the dead that Peter was preaching to a huge crowd at the temple, and he just told them the same thing. Acts 3.19, here's what you all need to do. You need to repent of your sins and turn to God so that he can give you the Holy Spirit so that times of refreshing can come from the Lord. This is what God wants to do. He wants to give you a new start. If we didn't need to make a change in our lives, we wouldn't have need Jesus, right? He wouldn't have had to come here and do everything he did. The things that we talked about and thought about during communion, as Pastor Jeff presented so well, the suffering that he literally went through, why would he put himself through that if there was another way for us to change? We all need to change. It's like a woman who signed up for a hot yoga class, and the instructor reached out to her and said, hey, one of the things you want to know for this class, you need to wear some loose-fitting clothes. And the lady's like, look, if I had loose-fitting clothes, I wouldn't need hot yoga. So, right? We all need to make a change, and baptism marks that change. And you don't have to change before you are baptized. It's like taking a shower so you can take a bath. You just need to say, I'm marking a turning point in my life. From here forward, God's going to be in control, and we're going to change some things. And so there's another thing here. Uh, that we want to think about, and that is that when Jesus was baptized, it was a very public commitment to God. And for us, the same thing is true. When you get in the water, you're declaring to anyone and everyone, I now belong to Jesus. I am a Christian. It's a very public thing to say, this is me, who I am now. I'm, I'm associated with him forever. It's kind of like when we get married. And some of you uh, are married, and you know what that's like. Some of you are, um, you know, single again, and that's okay. But if you can think of a wedding you've been to, isn't it a very public kind of a thing to stand before God and before all your friends and your family and say, till <coughs> death do us part, 
And it's hard sometimes to, to get in front of people just all by itself. It's, it's probably one of the most nervous feelings I've ever had was the day that we got married. But uh, it, it had nothing to do with the commitment. It just was it's people watching us. But uh, maybe you've had that experience where you just go, this is a commitment and I'm going public. And your baptism in, in the same way is that commitment before everyone, before God and for everybody else. I used to be this, but now I'm this. I'm turning my whole life to God. If you want to see how important this public commitment was for Jesus, just look at what he did. Now, this is where I want you to dig a little bit deeper into the words that we just read in the Bible, because it says that when, uh, I think it was back in Matthew 3, it says very casually, Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. How long does that take to read? Like three seconds? It's like reading Little House on the Prairie. You know, Laura went out and did her chores, and then she went to play. My chores never take that long. How long did it take to go from Galilee to the Jordan River? Is that like going from here to QT and back? Is that, was it like he got up one morning and said, I think I want to be baptized. I'm going to go see John. It's two blocks away. This was a long walk. It was something like 60 miles. Jesus didn't just decide one day, feeling cute, maybe I'll get baptized. I don't know. It wasn't a social media kind of thing. This was literally something he thought long and hard about, that he planned out, that he wanted to go public with his, you know, turning point in his life that I'm here to, to fulfill this ministry that God has given me. And for you too, your baptism is your way of saying, I'm all in. And uh, it's a commitment to God. And Jesus didn't go at night. He didn't wait till the crowds were gone. He didn't just send a personal DM to John and go like, keep this on the down low, but I think I'm gonna get baptized, but I don't want anybody to know because I don't want anybody to think I'm a sinner or anything. So no, he was very public. Lots of people saw this thing. It was a whole spectacle. It was a big deal. And so he's, when he did this, it's kind of like what we do. And many of you have been baptized, and you I don't know if you where you're baptized. We, like in the videos that you saw as the song was concluding, we've baptized people anywhere, backyard, baptistry, uh, in the river, the YMCA pool, wherever there's enough water to immerse somebody, we've probably used it. And um, there's been people who saw it. We have friends who, like down in New Zealand, they go to the ocean and they baptize people there. And I have a friend from Korea. He said that in the winter times when people are ready to be baptized, they just literally chip a hole in the ice in the river and they baptize them there. Aren't you thankful that we don't do that? If you want to, we can arrange that if you feel like that's what you really need. I've been, I've been a horrible person. I need to be. He says nobody ever gets sick, though, so that's cool. I just think it's important wherever it is that you're making this personal commitment to God. It's a public decision. It's a decision that you can make only for yourself. It's not a decision somebody else can make for you. It's your recognition that I need God and I'm going public with him. Now there's more here. Not only did Jesus' baptism illustrate his commitment to his uh, public, publicly saying, I'm in, and it was also a turning point in his life, but look down at verse 15. Jesus said it should be done when he's trying to convince John to baptize him because we must carry out all that God requires. Uh, the NIV gets it right. It's probably literally better just to say what he said, which was to, fill, fill, to fulfill all righteousness. And the reason why it's, you know, written the way it is, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires is because we're not quite sure what it meant when Jesus said to fulfill all righteousness. John apparently knew what he meant. I kind of think I know what it means. I'm open to hearing what you think. But when Jesus says we're going to do this to fulfill all righteousness, I think part of what he's saying is it's the right thing to do. For whatever scripture maybe he was fulfilling, whatever prophecy, whatever part of the plan that God had for Jesus, he's saying it's just the right thing to do. Doing this right now, you and me, John, you who's prepared the way for me to come, me as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, it is the right thing for me to be immersed in the Jordan River right now. For you, when you're ready to follow Jesus, your immersion is also the right thing to do. We're doing all of this because God has commanded us to do that. You know, and how do we know that it was good for Jesus himself to be baptized? Look at what happened when he was baptized. Maybe you've heard this before. Did you recognize when I read that, that the Trinity was fully present in that moment? And if you're somebody who says, I don't know that I understand the Trinity, well, me neither. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out. But in this moment, we had Jesus, the Son of God in the water. Who spoke? God the Father. So if you kind of thought of God as, well, like, did Jesus put everything on autopilot while he came here? Like, God was up there, but then he came here. There's, there's three persons to God. God the Father was in heaven watching his son be baptized, and he spoke. And who else was there of the Trinity? Holy Spirit in the form of 
a dove. We don't know if the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in actually literally a dove or if there was some other thing that everyone saw that they just said, I don't know what it was, but it reminded me of a dove as it descended. That's, have you ever seen a dove fly? I actually saw it last week off our deck, and it wasn't what I thought it was. It's beautiful. They swoop in. and So when the Spirit descended on Jesus, you had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three different people, all three together in the same place. And this is a beautiful picture. When, when God the Father says, in case you don't get it, this is my Son. And I love this kid. I am so proud of him. He is doing the right thing. He is carrying out the mission that we agreed to. He became a human being. He became one of us. He was here when the world began. He actually created the world. But he emptied himself of all of that and became one of us. You can't get any clearer than that. God the Father puts a stamp of approval on the ministry of Jesus the Son. The Holy Spirit filled Jesus and allowed him and enabled him to do all those miraculous things. Such wisdom that Jesus had. You'll never find anyone smarter, kinder, more loving than Jesus. This is literally God among us. And he said, this is the right thing to do. And it's the right thing for you to do. And you might be right now thinking, you know what? I think it is the right thing for me to do. You may have been thinking about this for a while. Or maybe you're just, as as I said, you're reflecting on when you were baptized and you're just, this is maybe reinforcing that was the right thing to do. But you might have some questions. And I get that. I want to just go through some of the most common questions I get from people who are thinking about being immersed. And maybe this will help you, but I don't want to short circuit any conversation you might want to have later. But you might be asking like, okay, so I think I should do this. When should I be baptized? What I would point you to, just here at Connection, is very important that if the Bible speaks to something, we want to do it that way. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. And we want to do Bible things Bible ways. So we say, well, people in the Bible were baptized. When did they do it? Let's go to Acts, which is a history of how the church began. Let's just see what the first Christians did. Acts 8, 13, it says Simon himself believed, and then he was baptized. So you see the progression here? Simon said, okay, I believe in Jesus And then he was baptized. And we see this again later in uh, Acts 18.8. It says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, who preached Jesus. They became believers, and they were baptized. You just see this progression over and over. People first believe in Jesus, and then they're baptized. It's consistently throughout the New Testament what we see. People are, first of all, putting their faith in Jesus, and then they express their faith in Jesus by going public in their baptism. It's kind of like when a couple gets married. You, you first say the vows, then you exchange the rings. Putting rings on a finger doesn't make you married. It's the commitment that you have for each other that makes you married. And the, the rings symbolize it. They show it. They illustrate it to everyone. And so in this way, when we say, I believe in Jesus, how do I express my faith? God has given you a built-in way to show that you believe him. Because belief is always illustrated in action. And God says, here's how I want you to illustrate that you, you, you believe, that you have faith. I want you to get in water and let somebody immerse you. Illustrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus right there. If you trust Jesus, you're ready to be immersed. You might say, I don't know if I know enough. Believe me, there's never a finish line. As a, at least if there is, I haven't found it yet. Maybe some of you who are older than me, you can tell me there is. But I suspect that it takes our lifetime and then some to get it all figured out. That's okay with God. He knows how much time he has to work with us. He's a patient teacher. You'll be fine. There's, there's no magical point where you suddenly know everything and you're ready. If you know enough to believe that I don't, I'm not going to get out of this thing any way other than with Jesus, then you're ready to commit to him, and you're certainly ready to be baptized. You might have some other questions. You might be thinking about how soon after I believe do I do this. In the New Testament, it was kind of one of those things where if they believed, they just did it. There was an instance, actually, where Paul... Uh, in the middle of the night, baptized some people like two in the morning because they were ready. Their whole family just decided, we want Jesus, we need Jesus, and they got baptized. That's just kind of what we see. And so if you're ready, you can be immersed. I told you we got a baptism Sunday coming up. If you want to go ahead and talk to us after service in the hub and say, hey, I think I'm ready to be immersed. How do I do this? We'll start the conversation and we'll get you going there. Uh, and if, and then I'm talking probably to a lot of different kinds of people. I always recognize that there are some of us who just aren't Christians. You've just, this is all new to you, and this is just, you're thinking it through, but you're ready. To the people who said, well, I, I've been a Christian for a long time. I was sprinkled when I was a baby, or, or I, sometime I don't remember my baptism. I'm not sure if I did it, so I think I should do that. And then stories all the way in between. I still remember my friend John coming to me, and he said, look, I grew up Catholic. 
I got sprinkled as a baby, but I don't remember it. I want to do my adult baptism. I want to like say I'm in as my own choice. And so that was so cool to be able to baptize him into Jesus Christ as well. And if that's your story, hey, we'll help you do that too. And you might have questions about, well, what happens when you're you know, baptized? Because I know different churches do things different ways. Again, I'm not throwing shade on any other church, but I don't own this store. I just work here. So I'm just going to tell you what the boss told me. And he told me to get in the water and be immersed. So that's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm inviting you to do. And you might go, okay, so what does that look like? I know there are churches that actually baptize, they immerse somebody three times, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I think I've told you before, if you're really bad, we don't baptize you three times, but we do hold you under till you bubble. So, um, no, we wouldn't do that, I promise you. Um, if this is the thing that you're thinking that you need to do, we'd like to help you do that. You know, we, and you might say, well, why do you do the whole immersion thing? And there's a lot of good reasons for that. I want to go into it more next week. We're going to talk more next week. I hope you'll be back for that. In the Bible, it, I assume we're all reading the English version of the Bible. It was originally, the New Testament was written in Greek, and so somebody had to translate it from Greek into English, and every time they got to this Greek word, baptizo, this is a crazy story. This goes back hundreds of years. They just literally wrote a Greek word with English letters. They just created a whole new English word, baptism, that didn't exist before because they saw all these churches doing different things that weren't actually, because the word baptizo literally just means immersed. It's sunken like a ship. There's a recipe from 3,000 years ago in Greek that we have found, like we found the piece of papyrus or whatever, and it says you take a cucumber and you baptizo it in water and salt. What are they making? Pickles. Yeah, it, the word baptism literally just means immerse. In, so that's, long story short, why do we immerse? It's what Jesus did in the Jordan River. He went down in the water. He came up out of the water. It's what the word literally means. It's probably the best way I can think of to illustrate a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And maybe it's your next step. Look, if this is something that you're thinking about doing, I would invite you to start talking to someone now about how you can make this a reality in your life. And uh, if you have already accepted Christ, again, I would invite you to think with great fondness, just with great thankfulness to God, and that he has invited you into his family and that he's given you a way to visibly show it. I would invite you to stand right now, and I want to pray for you. And you just be thinking about what your next step with Jesus is. And whatever it is, we want to talk. We want to help you take that step. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for coming here, for living a life that it wasn't just some kind of a publicity stunt where you just popped in for a few hours and left. You stayed here for 33 years. You, you lived a life completely like we do. But you didn't sin. And we all have, and we know that. And thank you for accepting us anyway. Thank you for literally giving your life in our place. Thank you for offering us this incredible offer to become your students, to learn from you how to live this life. The, the ways we've messed up, they're just countless, but the way to find righteousness and holiness and a new start is simple. It's just through you. Thank you for offering that. Please just make us so aware of what we each need to do next. Help us to have the strength and the courage to do it. Thank you for giving us such a way as baptism to illustrate our faith in you. I pray for anyone here now, Father, that you will just, through your Holy Spirit, help them to know what the next thing is to do. And uh, we're so thankful for the one, Judy, who's already coming to be baptized today. And we, as you welcome her into this family and as she does the right next thing, will you just continue to help her grow in her faith and be an example to any others who may come after her. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
invite you to be seated and direct your attention to the screen as we hear Judy's story. Hi, my name's Judy Morosowitz. I was born and raised in St. Charles County. I come from a very large farm family. I started coming to Connection because my daughter asked me to visit church one time with her. After one time, I asked, is this what it's like every Sunday? And she said, yes. <laughs> so I continued to come and now I have to come every week or my week just doesn't go well. <laughs> I was born uh, and raised Catholic. Uh, my whole family's Catholic. I raised my children Catholic. And as I got older, I just didn't feel like I was getting what I needed from church. Uh, didn't feel the connection or the community or, you know, just not connected to the church. Uh, not. Uh, feeling what direction to go or learning more about God. And when I came to Connection, it was a completely different story. Uh, it was actually everything I was looking for. Jesus has always been a part of my life, but there's always more to learn and to understand. And coming to, to Connection, just talking with the members, everyone's so happy to help you and help with your faith, understand where you're at and, and ask what they can do to help you. Everyone's so caring and giving and welcoming. I'm leading others to faith in Jesus by just simply talking to them and asking them to come to church. And I have asked my niece that's 15 and my granddaughter that's 10. And they were both a little hesitant to, about coming to church. And I said, it's only an hour long, just go with me one time. And they, they agreed and they responded the same way I did. On the car ride home, I asked, what did you think about church? And they're like, well, I really liked it. Is it like this every Sunday? <laughs> so they want to come every chance they get with me and, and truly enjoy it. So it's something that connection any age can find the connection and welcoming and learn about Jesus and feel good about it. I really want to be immersed today and baptized Christian because I feel it'll complete what I need in my life. It's, it's going to be the next step to completely connect with God and agree to do everything He's asking me to do. Get loud, church. Way. Amen. What a wonderful thing we got to celebrate together. Make sure to stick around and congratulate Judy on this decision she's made. And if you didn't stop by hospitality, she provided all the uh, yummy things that are out there today. And I, I might have snuck some banana cake after the first set real quick. It was great. I highly recommend it. If this is a decision that you want to make, like Brian said, please stop by the hub, talk to one of the pastors. We would love to, to help make that happen for you. I'd love to invite you to stand as we close with a benediction from 2 Peter 1-2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Have a wonderful week.